So remember this, what is up with this intro? I know for a fact that I was not the only one who went on Netflix the weekend Act 3 aired, clicked on episode 7, saw this intro, and was like, did I click on the wrong show? It's so jarring. The music style is different. The The animation style is different. We don't see anything like it in the rest of the show. It's, it's not even a scene. It's not part of the narrative. Okay, but here's the big question, glaring question. Every Arcane episode up to the finale has a flashback or a scene from the past as part of its beginning. Each of those episodes focuses on one character, and that character gets their flashback. And they change it up a bit in minor ways. For episode 1, it's a prologue technically, not a flashback, but still a scene about the sisters' past. Episode 2 doesn't start that way, it happens a bit into the episode. Episode 4 is a story about the past, and since the episode is about Piltover, it's about the city's past, not a character's. But same theme, every character gets a flashback, every episode opens by going back in time. Except... For Echo, the one character whose theme is time manipulation, the one character who can literally rewind time, his episode is the one that doesn't start by going back in time. This intro is not a flashback, so he's the one character who gets his own episode but doesn't get his own flashback. <laughs> That's when we choose to break this pattern. Doesn't that seem kind of weird to you? Okay, so I got some comments on my video last week about Marcus and bad characters, saying that I'm missing the distinction between side characters and main characters, and that comparing Marcus to a character like Vi, a very developed, very nuanced character, isn't fair when Marcus is just a side character. Side characters, the argument goes, do not need to be as interesting, as nuanced, as developed as main characters. And no, I disagree, so I'm going to respond by showing you what they did with Echo, because this is how you write a side character. Holy gosh, the writing with this character literally blows my mind to pieces. Because realize for a moment the amount of time they have. They have like five minutes to get you reinvested with this character. And the way they use it, and the groundwork they laid before that, so impressive. And we gotta start with this, because there's this big structural writing thing this character turns on its head. And I I should probably make a separate video about this at some point. This is a character design model I call the hero villain trifecta. I don't know if other people call it by other names, but the idea is that you'll often see this in stories. You got your hero, and then you have one villain who is an evil, a corrupted version of that hero. And then you have a second villain who's the other, who's everything our hero is not. And you see this model all over. Mario Wario Bowser, Luke Vader Palpatine, Harry Malfoy Voldemort, Ash Gary Team Rocket, Neo Cypher Agent Smith, Frodo Gollum Saruman, or Gandalf Saruman Saruman, Professor X Magneto and whatever human they're fighting. I could go on and on. You see this pattern very often. And it's very effective, both from the writing side and from the audience side. It helps us to see the nuances, understand the characters better. And one of the reasons it works is that it plays on two natural human fears or aversions. We fear what we can become, the evil inside of us, and we fear the other. We fear what's different, for better or for worse. Now, you don't see this model used in every story, and Arcane is one story where you don't really see it used, at least not in a normal way. But you do see the binary part of it used a lot. Not for hero-villain, because those lines are so blurred in the show, but just as a general character layout, two versions of the same basic character. You have the Piltover prodigy and the Zon prodigy. The Piltover misfit girl and the Zon misfit girl. You have the Piltover veteran scientist and the Zon veteran scientist. The Piltover law enforcement and the undercity law enforcement. And there's different ways of setting up the two sides, the good and evil undercity leaders, the good and evil undercity brawlers, the Piltover academic, the undercity academic, the Piltover character who's become more Zon-like, and the Zon character who's become more Pil Pil Piltoverian, Pil Pilto Pil Piltoven, Piltovovich. Okay, so now here's the weird thing. We don't get any villain who could be characterized as the other in Arcane, but what we do get is a hero who's the other in the form of Echo. And this is something that is rare to do and even rarer to do thoroughly. And that thoroughness is what I really want to explore here. That's what blows me away because they use everything in this characterization. Every question that's asked of this character must be answered outside the binary the show explores with the whole rest of the cast. I honestly think that's the principle that they had in mind when they were writing Echo. This is what begins to explain that weird intro. Listen to what it says. Zon Piltover? No, neither. We declare war on anyone standing in the way of what we want because both sides are standing in the way. No one wants what we want. We're not just side characters, we are the third player in this war. And this is why the show seemingly does something so random here. Why devote a full minute to this music video-esque thing when we only have five minutes to reintroduce this character? It's because the show has to prime us. This character is coming at everything you've seen so far from the story from within a different paradigm. This is why Echo's music style is so different from the rest of the music we hear in the show. It's why his scenes are the only ones stylized like this. This guy is different. He breaks the 
pattern of the society he lives in, so that's how he's introduced. Goes back to the characterization matching the character's personality thing we talked about in the Mel episode. And let's go through it. Let's go through all the patterns he breaks, all the binary elements you can use to characterize the whole rest of the cast that Echo has a third answer to. Which technology? Shimmer or Hextech? Neither. Nature? Time manipulation eventually? Different paradigm. In the Undercity, we're presented with two options, fight or make peace. Echo does neither. The Firelight's fighting style isn't the direct blunt force of Vi, it's not the sneaky underhandedness of Silco or of Jinx. Firelights swarm like flies and then run. They don't fight their enemies head on, they scatter, they paralyze. They favor mobility, overall power, evasiveness, defense. We see no other character even talk about defensive tactics in the whole show, except Echo. He mentions it to Vi, it's something that is important to him. And you still block with your face. And then the big prominent one, we see the entire cast sucked into two different vortices that can't escape. You have the characters who are stuck in the past. Vi, Jinx, who are constantly reliving the past, trying to get back to it, trying to recreate it. And then you have characters who can only think of the future, progress, Jason Mel obsessing over what Hexa can become, over what Piltover can become, and Victor as well, but also having his death, his fate looming over him, Heimerdinger, probably the worst of all, living hundreds of years in the future, can't see the present at all, even singed. Now for legacy are the sacrifices we make for progress. Progress. He's making sacrifices for the future, for his future discoveries. And then in a different sense, looking to the future politically. Silco dreaming of an independent Zon, and Bessa trying to juggle and plan for all these future wars. Even Caden, who starts out quite grounded, ends up trying to solve these grand problems, taking down the whole criminal enterprise, prevent war. Same with Vander, preventing war, this grand scary thing looming in the future. And who's left? Who's helping people now? Echo. Past, future, nope, third option, present. And that, I think, is the secret. This is an echo. The rewind isn't him, it's this. It's coming back to the present. We see him in his original cinematic redoing the same fight over and over again. Don't focus on him going back. He is using the past as a tool to construct the perfect present moment. Here's the thing about time. If you can't make the most out of any given moment, You don't deserve a single extra second. And if you think about it, an echo, what is an echo? It's not a memory, it's the sound of the past coming back to you now. And that's why he doesn't get a flashback, because echo is about the present. He's about the time that is currently passing now. And that's the hourglass. Hourglass is symbolized time, but if you think about it, hourglasses don't count time in the past, they count time going by now. Same with a stopwatch. And let me ask you this, what hurts firelights? Being trapped in the past. We see it twice, both times with Jinx, trapping the girl firelight in the memory of the past, and trapping echo in the memory of the past. And how do the firelights Firelights regard the past, firelights make peace with it. They don't run from it, they don't try to recreate it, they acknowledge what they've lost, they acknowledge the death they've experienced, and they use it to motivate them to continue to do their work for the present moment, helping people now. And this is the tree too, by the way, it's not just nature. Remember about the air in the Undercity? Victor's dying. I think it has something to do with gases in the fissures where he grew up. Have you forgotten where we came from? Air so thick it clogged your throat. <laughs> Stuck in your eyes. The Firelight's refuge literally allows them to survive by providing clean air for them to breathe. And what more of a present focus benefit is there than breathing? This whole community is built on simply enabling people to breathe clean air. I think this is also why the Firelights are so animal-like as well. It's about the going back to nature thing, but it's also kind of what animals are good at. Animals are great at living in the moment. There's the simplicity and peace about that, which is exactly what we see with this community. So it really is everything about this character, the entire characterization, every detail is about expressing that third option, the different paradigm. I mentioned that it's rare to see the hero other archetype because it's easier to make the other something you fear than something you admire, it just takes more work. But also it is a timing thing. Most stories just don't have time to fully develop a separate hero. But one place you actually do see the hero other archetype, a genre that generally has a lot of time to do stuff, is shonen anime. And anime has this thing they like to do where they code heroes as red and villains as blue. And when there's a hero side character that's different, that's other, what color do they get coded as? Green. So of course Arcane knows this opportunity took full advantage, worked out perfectly. Okay, now there's one more twist to this character which just wraps it all up in a nice bow. Because you could have had this hero archetype be anyone. And it would have looked a little different, but there's a lot of ways to do that third option. So why do they make it one of the Undercity kids? The only other surviving member of the Undercity kid group, actually. What's up with that? Why use Echo for this? So, interesting thing about Echo is that everything we've just talked about only applies to post-time skip Echo. What about pre-time skip Echo? Echo as a child is a totally different character. This guy just wants to fight. Actually, wait, listen to what he says. Um, oh, did Vi kick their asses? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be here otherwise. Oh, she showed me a couple of moves to practice. Look! <laughs> 
Echo as a child is almost exactly Powder. He practically worships Vi, he wants to be a fighter, but just isn't. He isn't good at what he admires. And for Powder, this leads to her making the ultimate mistake that cost her everything. Vi wanted her to stay put. Powder wasn't ready, she should not have gone with him that night. And Echo, Echo didn't go with him that night. And I think it's because his trauma started a bit earlier than Vi and Powder's. If he hadn't already lost his Vander to the monsters, he would have been in Vi wannabe mode just like Powder and he would have died. Instead, he stayed away during the Benzo murder he was hiding. During the rest of it, he presumably hid. He he avoided the fight. Throughout all of Arcane, we see characters embracing the state they were in or the mode represented during their childhood trauma. Powder assumes the identity of the jinx she was that night in episode 3. Vi was ready to give up fighting and turn herself in, but because of that night, she gets stuck in punch-only mode. Jace's trauma introduced him to the altruistic use of magic, and he fixated on that. For Mel, it was ruthlessness, the fox and the wolf, and she couldn't escape that paradigm. For Echo, it's avoidance, and I hate that that term has a bad connotation. It's good avoidance. It's escaping. It's protecting himself. It's walking away or even running away when you should run away, when it's the smart thing to do, because often it is the smart thing to do. That was Echo, the night of episode 3. He embraced that philosophy of smart avoidance for a good purpose. That's the man he became. With some of these characters, you see parallels. We had Kate and Anti-Kate last week. Soon we'll be exploring Vi and Anti-Vi. Echo isn't that. He isn't a foil for Powder. He's AU Powder, different timeline Powder. We see him and we see Powder, and we see that they weren't just childhood friends. They were cut from the same cloth, same hopes, same talents, same things holding them back. And then they both both experience the trauma of losing everyone they love in one night. And remember, these are both orphans. They both already lost everyone, and now it's going to happen again. And you know, we forget that Echo also lost everyone that one night. And when we see all that, when we see Echo just barely manage to set himself down a different path and thrive because of it, we really see what could have been to quote Sting. And this is something that enriches the tragedy of Powder. I think that's the purpose of it. If only she had stayed away that night. If only she had comprehended the trauma awaiting her down that path. We see the kind of good life she might have carved out for herself. Not this, but something like this. Maybe, who knows? That's a good way to drive yourself crazy. That's a line Echo says after Vi says she should have been there for him. Very consistent with what we've said. We can't get held back by the past like that. And then, funnily enough, right after he says that, he just totally contradicts himself. If I just went with you that day, maybe none of this would have happened. But I think this is also him acknowledging that he suffered from that craziness too. He has the same thoughts. He's not immune from the trap of the past just because he chose the road of the present. It's a hard road for him to walk. And he struggles and it drives him crazy too. That honesty is also part of acknowledging the past, admitting its effects, grieving, healing from it. That craziness is also a part of him, even if he knows it drives him crazy. And by the way, this acts as a foreshadowing of how he does eventually get trapped in the past at the end of this episode. Yeah, so just a different level of intentionality. It's every Every detail in this character, seriously. So that's what you can do with a side character. And yeah, I'm not saying every character should be this specifically, but something with this level of intentionality and attention to detail, yeah, I am saying that. Put this much work into side characters, not this much work. Those four standards I mentioned last week that can make or break a character that Marcus utterly failed in, interesting, nuanced, likable, developed, Echo completely nails all four. Everything we talked about here is in the interesting and nuanced categories, but he's cool as well in the likable category. And he has a whole arc too, which we didn't even discuss, where we see what happens when he doesn't walk away and he does confront. And it's a whole arc, this one scene, and they didn't even need to give him an arc in the first place, but they did a whole arc for him in two minutes. And that's the other part of this. This argument that side characters shouldn't have detailed characterization is assuming that characterization is proportional to screen time and audience attention, but it's not at all. Making Echo's aesthetic interesting, making the Firelight's fighting style different and nuanced takes no time. It doesn't take away from these scenes with the main characters, it adds to them. I don't want Echo or Marcus to be the main focus of Arcane on the level of the main characters. I want each scene to present a character in a way that if I do choose to focus on them, if I scratch the surface, I'll find a wealth of interesting characterization. I'll find a rich human life. I scratch the surface of Marcus and I find nothing. I need to go outside his character for anything interesting. Echo I scratch the surface of and I find everything I talked about in this video. That's what I want for my side characters. They don't demand your attention, but you sense there's something more there. And if you do choose to pay attention, there's a payoff. There's a lot more there. Okay, I got one more thing to talk about, and uh, yeah, I, I was on the fence of whether or not to include this, but I think you guys are going to find it interesting. And that said, feel free to skip this, click off. Main part of this video is over. See you Wednesday for a one minute analysis. Thanks for watching, etc. So it feels weird to include this in the video, but I had the sense watching Echo that this character reminds me of someone. And when I was doing research for this video, I came across a tweet from Amanda Overton about how Echo gathered up a crew by helping other victims suffering under Silco's rule. And I thought Echo was reminding me of a character from something else. And then I saw this and I realized, no, it's someone I know in real life. It's this guy I met, Typhoon. He's from a place called Mathare. This is this is what it looks like. And so when, when Typhoon was nine, he ran away from home because his mother was too poor to feed him. And he grew up on the streets. He'd go uptown 
town every day to beg, you know, to the to the richer areas. And uh, this is, you know, he was he was young. He was nine years old. He was really small. And the older boys didn't want him in their gang. So they every day they just beat him up. They took all of his money that he got that day from begging. And he was totally alone. He was an easy target. And he lived like this for years. And one day when he was 12 or 13, he, he was still young compared to the other kids in the gangs. But the strategy started to form. He started to, he started to understand something. He would totally get thrashed by these older kids on a daily basis. But he started realizing that he wasn't the only one. There were a lot of younger kids like him, alone, easy targets. So he started discreetly following these older gangs around. And whenever they jumped one of these little kids, Typhoon would watch it all go down. Then he'd come around afterwards and tell that kid, hey, I also got beat up, we should stick together. So he did this, he went to every single kid he could find who got targeted like this. He gathered this big group and the strategy worked. And not only did the group start protecting themselves with just their numbers, but you know, they, they were little kids, but they were all growing up. They were becoming older, stronger, smarter. And Typhoon just took advantage completely of the short-sightedness of these older gangs. That he understood, he understood that lonely kids don't stay lonely if you give them a reason to stick together. And Typhoon became the leader of one of the most dangerous gangs in all of Nairobi, and he was just 15 years old. And at this point, then his story diverged from Echoes. All he thought about was money at this point in his life. He was desperate, and that desperation destroyed him. Typhoon told me in really scary detail what it's like to do violence, real terrible violence, the worst he can think of to innocent people and feel nothing. And this state he was in, this, this really horrible state, it continued past watching all of his friends get killed or arrested, past he himself getting arrested, even once he was released from prison, you know, he was still in this mindset. And it only changed when he became a father. Then he started to finally understand empathy and feel it again. And now, you know, by, by the time I met him, he's, he's a completely different person. He totally reformed, kind, really great guy. He's made a business of helping people understand what it's like to grow up on the streets in a city like Nairobi. You know, snatching phones, getting chased, crawling through sewer pipes to escape, back home to the dump where he lived. And I mean, I mean, literally, he lived in a garbage dump for a number of years. Echo really made me think of Typhoon. Echo's story is dark, but he makes something of it. And Typhoon's story is is darker, but now he's raising a family and he's making something of it too. Here's me and him. I think he kind of looks like Echo too, like Echo in maybe like seven to eight years. Could definitely cosplay as him. But yeah, so I mean, yeah, we, we think of Piltover and Zahn as fantasy sci-fi and that's true, but under cities do exist and people live like that. People, you know, people have these stories.